Welcome to 168 Community Church. I'm Carl, one of the pastors here at 168. Our name, 168, comes from 1 Chronicles 16.8. In this verse, we see a new story beginning for God's people, one where they're pursuing God, participating in their community, and proclaiming God to all people. This is who we want to be as a community. We want to help people pursue Jesus, participate in the flourishing of our communities, and proclaim Jesus among all people. Here at 168, we believe in community. We believe in walking through seasons of life together. So before you leave today's service, whether in person or online, please feel free to ask for prayer, counsel, or help. Our community is here to support one another in good times and bad. I'm Carl Fisher, and remember, you have 168 hours this week. Go and leverage every single one for Jesus. Well, good morning. It feels good to say good morning. Happy Easter. He is risen. All right. We're going to get started with our songs. And kids, you know this one really well. So sing loud. And if you want to do the motions, do the motions. Okay? Because we're so happy you're joining us this morning. All right. Let's stand up and worship together. Who's loving? 
going to need a little help on this one too. The chorus is, how great, how great, how great is your love. How many, how great did I say? Anybody know? <laughs> oh, I think we might keep going. Three. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so it goes like this. How great, how great, how great is your love. Sing that with me. How great, how great, how great is your love. Then it changes a little. How great, how great, how great is your love. One more. How great, how great, how great is your love for us. All right, I think we're ready. Help us out. This one's a hard one for us. For real. <laughs> From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. For my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. Sounds great. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down.
good morning. I'm so happy that I get to be in this room with all of you guys and all of the kids together. So hey kids, hi grown-ups, it's nice to be with you this morning. So as you take your seats, here's just a, cute, a few quick announcements for this morning. The first one is if you're here for the first time or are streaming with us, um, the name 168 comes from 1 Chronicles 16.8, which states, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, um, make known his deeds to the nations, which forms our mission statement, pursue, participate, and proclaim. So, which leads me to announcement number two. So if you're looking for ways to participate and proclaim the name and love of Christ this summer, be on the lookout for our 168 summer events calendar, which will be coming soon. And then number three, today we will explore the love shown to us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But come back next week because we're going to explore how the change in us begins with heart change and then shows itself through the way we love ourselves, the community around us, and our world. So come back next week for a new series titled Inside Out, where we will explore what it looks like to live out our faith out loud through the book of James. And then lastly, thank you for all of you who have supported the mission and vision that God has for 168. For without all of your generous gifts, we would not be able to live out the mission that God has placed on us for the communities around us and the world. So if you are interested in, in supporting the mission and vision here at 168, you can give in three ways. The first is give online at 168cc.org. Two, give here in person in the silver box by the door. Or three, mail a check or money order to the address on the screen. Um, and now before we get into the sermon, will you join me in prayer? Um, dear God, I just thank you so much for today, for the gift and the privilege that it is to come and to worship your name and for the promise that one day every knee and every tongue will bow and proclaim that same name, God. It is a holy one and we are so thankful for the sacrifice that you made on Friday and that you came back to life to show us that there is nothing in this world that you cannot conquer. Thank you for that gift and I thank you for this community of people who we can praise that name together and sing that name and that we can believe that truth together. Dear God, I just pray that you would bless this sermon and that our hearts would just be open to um, your word and to the love that you have for us and that we would see how we can pour that love out on others. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I think I turned myself on. My guy back there is giving me the thumbs up, so I turned myself up. But as I was saying, that's my wife, Liz. If you haven't met her, that's my better half. Uh, I love her. I'm so glad she gets to be up here with you all. But I want to start my message by simply saying this. He is risen. He is risen. Come on, he is risen. I don't know about you, but I woke up this morning, and I was like, he is risen. And so am I. Amen. Amen. Well, if you haven't noticed, we actually have the kids in here with us today. And so I'm so excited because one of my favorite things to do is to tell stories. Not the lies, but like stories. Like I like to recreate stories. You know, like if you want to hear a really awesome tale of Finding Nemo, like come find me. I will do every voice you can find. But today we're going to talk about the story starting at Good Friday, and we're going to lead up to resurrection, to the empty tomb. So kids, I'm going to need you to kind of follow me. Let me have you stand up some points. We're going to move our bodies a little bit because I'm like you. I can't sit down too long. I'm already pacing back and forth over this tape. I will probably trip over it at some point. It's okay to laugh. I will laugh. Uh, but I'm going to need you guys to follow me in some of the things that I do. Is that cool? Yeah. Wait. I just gave you guys donuts. Is that cool? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. So here's where we're going to start our story. It all started on a Friday night. And on this Friday night, Jesus had been captured by the guards after he had got done loving on his disciples, even one with the name of Judas. And what he did was he washed their feet. Can you guys, kids, can you guys stand up and do this? Can you guys go, he washed their feet. And he washed their feet, and then he loved them so much and Judas ran out from that dinner and betrayed Jesus. He ran out and he betrayed Jesus to the guards, the man that he had loved, had been loved on and by taught. And then Jesus was being led away 
And as Jesus was being led away, the other 11 disciples, they followed really close. But so not so close that the guards would be like, take all 11 of those people. But close enough where they can see where Jesus was going. But what they knew is they were about to, they didn't know what they were about to watch. But what they watched the next day is they watched the punishment that Jesus took that was meant for all of us. They stood by and they watched as Jesus paid the price that was way too much for us to bear. Now, if you don't know what that looked like, Jesus was mocked and he was beaten and he was dressed in the crown of thorns and forced to carry a cross. All right, kids, get up. This is what it feels like to carry a cross. You ready? Adults, if you're feeling froggy, and you got the knees, stand up with us. Jesus had to carry his cross like this. Can you guys do that? Ready? Jesus carried his cross. But that cross was so heavy because it was all of our crosses on top of that cross. He didn't just carry his cross to Calvary. He carried all of our crosses. Look at your parents and be like, he carried Joe cross. My mom's here too. He carried Joe cross. See, I'll, I'll lead by example. My kids are looking at me right now like, yeah, he carried your cross, Dad. <laughs> See? But he carried all of our crosses to the place where he would ultimately die for all of us. And Jesus was willingly to take this punishment and abuse knowing it was the only way for us in the whole world to stay alive for eternity. Not just for however long we're going to live on earth, but forever, for eternity. And Jesus was nailed to that cross. And as he was nailed to that cross, he cried out to God and he asked God why God had forsaken him. And then he let out a second cry. And with that, Jesus gave up his spirit. And with that, he succumbed to sin so that we no longer would have to. So that we no longer would have to. Now, Everyone else that saw this, they went away and they were sad. Can you guys do this? They were sad. They were sad. And they lamented the fact that they had lost their teacher. They had lost their friend. They had lost their brother. They had lost the person that they had followed for so many years from town to town preaching and proclaiming the good news. But then there was one disciple. We just sang about him, right? They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. There was a guy, his name was Joseph of Arimathea, and he pled to the chief priests and the rulers to allow him to take Christ's body to a tomb that he had built with his own hands. Now, how many people in here like big trucks, big construction, big construction trucks? He did not have a big construction truck. He probably had a nice little hammer that he made himself that was wrapped in leather and a nice little chisel, and he... Can you guys do that? He went. And he dug out that tomb. And he pleaded that he could lay our Lord and our Savior in this empty tomb wrapped in fresh and clean linens. And he laid his body in there. So Joseph takes the body. And behind him is Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James. We're going to call them Mary Mary. If I break out into shackles, the song, I'm just thinking about the band Mary Mary. But we're going to call them Mary Mary. But Mary and Mary, they were following Joseph, and they watched him as he wrapped Jesus in this linen and placed him in this tomb. And then like the other disciples, all three of them, they left, and they were sad, and they lamented the loss of their teacher and their friend and their brother. And this is where we're going to begin our story today. So Adelch, you can kick back in. This is where we're going to start, what we're talking about today. This is where we'll begin today. We'll begin on the third day after Jesus was laid in the tomb. We will talk about resurrection morning. So if you have your Bibles... Open up to Matthew 28, 1. So Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. And so here's, what, here's what's going on. Now, Jesus has been dead for three days. I'm going to give you the story. Jesus has been dead for three days. All right, everybody, if you can, stand up. Everyone. I'm a youth pastor at heart, so I'll wait. <laughs> everyone. Jesus has been dead for three days, and here's the things that happened. I need everyone to shake. Shake, 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 shake. A little more violently than that. The earth shook and the veil was torn from top to bottom. I like to make this sound like this. And the veil was torn. And what happens now is everyone believes that this, this same shake, everybody shake, whoop, whoop, everybody shake. 
This same shake, this same earthquake, is the same earthquake that they felt on the third day. They call it the aftershock. You guys can sit. <laughs> they call it an aftershock. And still slightly afraid, the priests actually send two guards to go guard this tomb because they don't know. They don't want people still in the body proclaiming that Christ was raised from the dead when really the disciples just stole the body. So there are two guards in front of Jesus' tomb with a heavy stone rolled across. But the day of the Sabbath now has ended. So if you guys aren't familiar with Jewish culture, on Sunday, they are not allowed to do anything. They are not allowed to do it. All the kids are like, yeah, yeah, let's go back to that. Sundays of nothing, right? They couldn't do anything. So as bad as the disciples and Mary, Mary wanted to run back to the tomb, they were not allowed to by culture. They were not allowed to run back. They had to sit in their seats like you guys are right now and do nothing. I'm already fidgeting, thinking about doing nothing. But they had to sit there. And then it opens up and it says this. After the Sabbath, so after the Sabbath had ended, and it ends at midnight, so after the Sabbath ended at dawn on the first day of the week, which is Monday, Monday, it's Monday, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James, they went to the tomb. All right. Can you imagine this? This is what I imagine them doing all Saturday. Oh, my goodness. <sighs> right? And then on Sunday, they're like, my legs hurt, but I want to pace but I can't do anything. And then they sleep. And then they probably didn't sleep, right? How many of you guys sleep like this? All the parents were like, I do. I do. I do every night. I'm waiting for somebody to come in my room and wake me up or somebody to be scared. But they were, they were just as scared, right? And they're waiting for the dawn. At the break of dawn, they ran. They reign. So imagine with me, right? You've been anxiously waiting to get back to the tomb so that you can anoint Christ in traditional spices as, as according to Jewish burial culture. So the day breaks on the Sabbath of rest, and they are running. All right, kids, stand up. It's time to burn off that donut. Mary and Mary got out of their beds and stretched. Oh, and immediately did what your moms do. They put their clothes on. They go, ah! can you guys do that? Ah, and they ran, they ran, they ran, they ran just like that to the tomb, barely with the right coming over the horizon. And then maybe they were stirred, maybe the aftershock of the ground shaking like that stirred them up. And they got up and they ran to the tomb. Either way, they get there. And when they get there, what the first thing they see is they see this bright, shining light, kind of like what I'm looking at right now, shining over this camera right now. And they see this bright, shining light. And then once they get undistracted by this bright, shining light, they see two guards on the ground, shocked in paralysis. They're, meaning they're like this, right? I like to think of them like, how many of you guys have seen Home Alone? I think, all the, I think the guards on the ground like this. That's my, that's my favorite, that's what I think, I think, imagine that. Imagine the guards on the ground. And this is exactly what Mary and Mary see when they arrive to the tomb of Christ. So then we get to it, how it describes it in chapter uh, 28, verse two, and it says this, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. Come on. My man is just sitting there like, yo, I was waiting for all y'all. I knew y'all would come. Right? He's probably like, y'all see my aura? Y'all see this light? Don't look at me. Look inside. Right? But he's sitting there on top of this rock, on top of the heavy stone that had been pushed away. And it says his appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. Kind of like this tablecloth here. His clothes were like white as snow, and the guards were so afraid that they were shook and became like dead men. They were paralyzed. They couldn't move. So now Mary and Mary are probably in shock at the scene that they witnessed, and then they see this bright light like the angel of the tomb. They must have looked surprised and shocked on their face, and the angel responds to them by saying what all angels say, right? Do not be afraid. I would be afraid, okay? I was literally walking yesterday and a goose flew by my face and I was afraid. <laughs> you hear me? Kaya was horseback riding yesterday and I was walking to the stable to watch her ride and a horse was like, Burr! and I was like, ooh, okay, I'm gonna go this way. <laughs> I was afraid, right? So an angel looking at me being like, do not be afraid. I'm like, look, man, you must not know me. <laughs> I'm already afraid. But he's telling them, he's calming them down saying, do not be afraid. And I believe what Jesus wants us to feel every time we come to him through the Holy Spirit is this, do not. Be afraid. Do not be afraid. Every time you come to the, to the Lord through the Holy Spirit, do not 
be afraid. He does not want us to be afraid to come to him in any situation. Because what the angel says next is the key to our text for today. He tells them that they are looking for Jesus who was crucified. Now, we might be tempted to hear this statement and say, yes, Jesus was crucified. He was crucified. We knew that. We saw that, right? But what the angel was pointing to as a fact is this. It's showing, like, this is the reality. Jesus died. Believe it. Jesus did die. For us, Jesus did die, proving his humanity and that his sacrifice was indeed a sacrifice for all of human life. That's the first half of this. Jesus, who was sacrificed, Jesus, who was crucified, he really died. Then the angel says next, he says, come and see the place where they lay. And what he's doing is he's assuring Mary and Mary, he's saying, look, you are in the right place, right? How many of you guys drove to the wrong place this morning? <laughs> right? Right? He was like, hey, you are in the right place. You are in the right place. This is the exact tomb you saw last night. And what he was saying in that was, listen to me. Jesus died. That's reality. Wake up. Well, here's your new reality. Jesus is alive. Kids, can you say alive? Jesus is a... Jesus is a... Jesus is alive. And that he is risen, showing us that our debt has been paid and the war on sin has been defeated. Can I get an amen? amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. Now, this, this is the truth. Jesus was fully human and fully God. And through his death, he proved his humanity that by giving up his life, it was a sacrifice. And he was risen. And he, because he was risen, we can have confidence and an unwavering assurance that Christ has won the war on sin. Can I get an amen again? Amen. Christ has won the war on sin. But this truth should always ground us in this life. This truth should ground us, right? This truth should just root us down wherever we're standing. And that brings us to our first point today, and that is this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ must be revisited often in order to set right, in order to be set right in this life. The resurrection of Jesus must be revisited often in order to be set right in this life. I mean, think about it like this. Like in my life, when I have troublesome events come, or even when my life is going great, right? Like, you know those moments where you're like floating on cloud nine? I had this moment like all day yesterday. I was like floating on cloud nine like all day yesterday. But then I need to come back, right? I need to come back. I need to ground myself. And one of the things that I love to ground myself with is nature. I love to go outside. I love to hear the water flow in the creek, right? I love to hear the birds at a distance <laughs> flying, right? I love to see people walking their dogs. I love just to be outside. I don't even mind trains or cars or trucks. I just like to be out in nature because it reminds me of God's grace and God's heart for us and God's soul for us. So when I need to come back and set my life right, I go back to nature because it reminds me of God. But in the same way, we must look to the resurrection of Jesus and the empty tomb often. Not like every, like once a year, maybe twice because we look at it on Good Friday and we look at it like, like every day. Like every day we should go back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that empty tomb and allow that to set us right for the day and humble us in this life. Listen, being set right in this life means using the resurrection as a point in your faith journey that you visit in order to allow the Lord to inspect your heart, to inspect your life so that you can correct things that are not reflecting the love of Christ to the world and the communities around you. Now, we could stop right there and be like, hallelujah, amen, Christ is risen, empty tomb, right? It keeps going, though. The angel of the Lord doesn't stop there, letting us know that this is not enough to be set right. We have more to do. So we're going to pick it back up in verses 7 and 8. In verses 7 and 8, it says this. He says, then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. And, and ran and told his disciples. That's where we're going to stop, right? First, the angel makes sure that Mary's know that, God, that uh, Christ was raised by God. And I want, I, I want to point this out to you, because I think oftentimes we get, we get messed up, right? We think that, like, Jesus went in the tomb, and Jesus, like, raised himself from the tomb, right? And if you believe that, I feel bad for you, because then you'll read Paul's writings, and you'll be like, this makes zero sense. Paul is telling that we're raised with Christ. I thought Christ raised himself. There is a Greek verb in there. It's called e e gift, e gift, And it's simply a passive verb, meaning he was raised. 
meaning that like God raised Jesus from the dead. That means that God is the one that raised Christ from the dead, and God is the one that will resurrect you from the dead and bring you into your new life, into your eternity with him. Hold on, I don't think you guys heard that good news. That means that God is the one that raised Christ from the dead, and God is the one that will resurrect you from the dead and bring you into new life in Christ and you into eternity with him. Amen? Amen. Come on. Come on, man. Come on. We hung out with the Baptists on, on Friday night now. I'm a little fired up now. Come on. Come on, come on. Now, with, the, with, with this, the angel gives Mary and Mary and us the full story of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, imagine you heard a story, and you had evidence that Christ was risen, and you told no one. You see this empty tomb, and you're like, yo, I'm going home. I'm good, bro. It's time to eat ham, cheesy potatoes, lamb, you know, mac and cheese, eat that key lime pie I've been waiting on, that carrot cake, you know. I'm just going to go home and keep this news to myself, right? Don't, it's okay. We're all going to do that later. It's cool. It's cool. It's all right. But imagine that Mary and Mary had done this, right? They went home, and they just was like, I'm going to go about my day. Christ is alive. Imagine knowing the greatest news of all time and experiencing the greatest gift but not sharing it with anybody. I hate to break it to you. This is what we do today. We read and we experience the power of the gospel. We experience Jesus Christ in our lives, and we simply just live our lives without sharing this news with anyone. I'm not going to put you on blast because I put myself on blast, but think about the last time you shared the gospel. And I'm not saying you opened up your Bible and you read it. I mean the last time you shared about where you were, when you met Christ, and how you are now. When's the last time you told that story? When's the last time you shared that with somebody else? I said, I'm not going to put y'all on blast because I put myself on blast, okay? But think about that. Think about that. But if this is you, let seven and eight be the match that ignites your passion for Jesus Christ. Your match, your light that shines so bright to the world through your actions and your entire life. May you go quickly and proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ to all people. May you go with all your mixed emotions and proclaim the truth of Jesus in this life to all people. May you go into the world with the assurance that Jesus has prepared a place for you in eternity. If you're taking notes, here's the second point and the last point for today. The resurrection of Jesus Christ must be the conviction that ignites your passion to live as one sent by Christ to the world. All right, do I have any Chicago baseball fans in the room. I'm about to divide the room real quick. <laughs> and yes, I'm judging you by whatever hand you raise for whatever I'm about to say. Okay. For all my South Side baseball fans, yay, yay. Yay, yay. Come on, come on. What happened in 2005? What happened in 2005 after the good guys won the World Series by a sweep of the Houston Astros? What happened? Many of us Lifelong fans, new fans, all of us, right? What did we do? We couldn't stop bragging about that title. Any conversation we ended up, we pulled it back to that title, right? Hey, man, this mac and cheese is good. Yeah, not as good as my white socks. <laughs> hey, man, you drive really fast. Yeah, not as fast as my white socks for that World Series title. You know what I'm saying? Everything came back to this, right? Everything came back to this title. Oh, and don't let us get into a conversation with Cubs fans between 2005 and 2016, right? We were like, ha-ha, keep waiting. That's real cute, your little Little League stadium up north. That's real cute. Keep waiting, right? This was all, I, I kid you not, I was probably the worst. I got, had a boss that was a Cubs fan, and I used to wear my White Sox World Series shirt under my, like, work shirt. So if you ever got too big for his britches, I'd be like, yo, remember this? Right? That's how we were, right? We, we talked about it to everybody. I mean, some of us still talk about it to this day. Right? All right, all right. So you see my picture up there? No, go back, go back. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah! My Cubs fans over there running the tech over there. I see you, Braden. Trying to move on. Right with him from my North Siders, 2016. The Cubs won the World Series. It was really exciting. I watched. Woo! You guys can thank the Lord for the rain. Come on, praise the Lord for the rain. We all know. Praise the Lord for the rain. But many new, new Cubs fans were created that day, and many lifelong Cubs fans got to see their dreams. They got to see their team live out a World Series championship. I, there, there's one fan in here right now that was my favorite to watch the whole series. Yeah, Ian. Yeah, Ian. Ian's documentary on him watching the whole series, especially Game 7, that is like Netflix-worthy stuff. And I was so, I was like, I wasn't even mad the Cubs won. I was so happy for Ian. Like, I was so happy for Ian. I'm for real. 
But listen to me, like I say all that and I joke about these pictures and I joke about championships uh, because when something unexpected happens and something extraordinary happens, we often have a hard time not sharing this news with everyone who will listen and often those who won't listen, right? We are willing to fight to make sure that that news is never tainted and always is seen as true or fact, right? We record these events on our TVs and our history books on web pages with trophies, with banners. Some of us have mock rings. Right? Some of us, I've seen so many people with those news articles clipped up in their garage to remind themselves that this actually happened. But in the same way, we must be champions of the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We must live it out in a way that honors God. We must constantly seek to understand more and more about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. We must fight in our personal lives for the truth that continues to ring in that empty tomb in our lives. The truth that continues to ring in that empty tomb in our lives. We must stand up for the truth of the gospel when it is under attack. And we must reflect and be a reflection of the love that Christ has shown to the world through his resurrection. We must be Christ's ambassadors to the world. Look, we know this to be true. Jesus in Matthew 28 tells us exactly what we are to do with our lives. It didn't stop that they ran into Jesus and Jesus said, go tell my guys to go to Galilee. It didn't stop there. And I'll tell you right now, I think one of my, in my lifetime, one of the biggest faults that I've ever seen on Easter Sunday is I've seen a lot of churches stop at eight. They stop at eight. And they say, Jesus is alive. He went to Galilee and they saw him. But let me tell you, the truth of 28 is 16 through 20. Because 16 through 20 tells us exactly what Christ has called us to do. There is no more doubt. This is exactly what you're supposed to do. This is exactly what it says in 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them. Come on. Keep listening. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's all right. It wasn't a doubt like you're not who you say you are. It was an unbelief. It was a, I saw you. I saw the blood. I saw your soul go. I saw you die. And it was more of like, I cannot believe you are who you say you are. I'm in shock, but I still believe, and I'm still here. And then Jesus came to them and said this, and this is where, I'll, if you got a highlighter, highlight this and go back to this forever. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus decrees us to continue his ministry. He commands us to continue the ministry, the journey that he put us on. He, co he commands us, he tells us that we are to go and spread the good news of the resurrection to all people. Now that means every community we are involved in. That doesn't mean, that's not hate. I'm going way over there, right? I'm going, I'm going way over the other side of the ocean. That's not what that means. That means I want all of you to think about where are you going tomorrow morning? Adults, where are you going tomorrow morning? From 7 to 4, 8 to 5, 9 to 5, where are you going? That's the community that God has called you to go and make disciples and proclaim his death and his resurrection, to go and be obedient to all the things that he has taught you. Kids, you guys are going to school. That's a community for you to be Christ in. Some of y'all are going to go to coffee shops. That's a community. Some of y'all are going to hang out with your families, and you know what's up. That's a community for you to be Christ in, to live out 16 through 20 in. Listen, this means that we are not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us to make sure that all people know that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no person... Not one person, dead or alive or to come, comes to the Father except through him. Jesus declares to us that we need to continue living lives that are holy and pleasing to God. And finally, Jesus leaves us with the assurance that he will never leave us till the end of the age. I don't know about you, but that is good news. That is good news. Listen, I'm going to call the worship team up here. I'm going to wrap up. The resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that Jesus is the Son of God and the fulfillment of the law and the prophecies. The empty tomb 
is where our life begins. The empty tomb is where our life begins. The empty tomb is the lighter, the fluid, the spark that ignites our passion and our devotion to the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. It is the key to our eternal futures that lie in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The key to our eternal futures lies in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to leave you with three words. I'm going to explain them. You simply need to do this. You need to come to this moment daily. Come to this moment daily. See slash reflect on what this moment means to us and our faith walks and worshipfully, catch that, worshipfully proclaim the love of Jesus Christ with your life while completing the mission that Christ has set you on. Bow your heads with me as I pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you. Lord, you sent your son, and you did not have to send your son. God, you sacrificed all that you love for us because you loved us so much. Lord, as we think about this victorious Sunday, God, we think about the empty tomb, we think about Friday, we think about the lamenting and the sadness and how it led to this ultimate joy. This ultimate assurance, God, that we can have in our lives, God, that we know that you are with us until the very end of the age and that we have eternal life with you. God, I'm reminded of all the things in my life that you've brought me through. And I know a lot of people in this room feel the same way. They can think about all the things that you have brought them through. God, may we go to the tomb, the empty tomb daily and be humbled and be set right in this life so that we can go out and worshipfully proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ until you return. God, you are loving. You are faithful. You are just. You are gracious. God, we are so grateful for all that you are. Amen. We're going to ask you guys to rise and stand. And as you rise and stand, we are going to declare this. We are going to declare that it is done and that it is finished and that Christ has won. Sing this with us.
Amen and amen. Amen. It is done. It is finished. Christ has won. Sin is defeated forever. Sin is defeated forever. Live in that freedom. Come to that moment daily. Reflect on that moment in your life and allow it. Allow it to be the inspection, the magnifying glass in your heart. And then take that and proclaim the love of Christ in your life while completing the mission that Christ has set you on. He is risen. Come on. He is risen. Amen. As we say, you have 168 hours. Go and live every single one for Jesus Christ because he is risen. Amen. We'll see you guys next week as we start Inside Out, living your faith out loud. Go and be blessed to live in the freedom of Christ's resurrection.